Good morning, Sunnyside family and friends. Welcome again on this blessed Sunday. Such an awesome privilege to stand before you and bring you the word of God on today. Let me ask you, are you expecting something great from the Lord? Are you ready to receive from him? Should he grant you all of your prayer requests today? Is your heart ready to receive? That's the question we're asking this morning. How is the condition of your heart? Hey, I don't want anything to stand in the way of my blessing. I don't want anything to come, to come between what me and, and what God has for me. So please enjoy this sermon this morning, A Heart Condition. Good morning, friends. If you have your Bibles, I want you to go with me to the Old Testament book of Judges. It's Judges, the 10th chapter. And I'm going to begin reading at the 10th verse, Judges 10. Verse 10, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. And the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Did I not deliver you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites and from the children of Ammon and from the Philistines? The Zidonians also and the Amalekites and the Maonites did oppress you. And ye cried to me, and I delivered you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Wherefore, I will deliver you no more. Go and cry unto uh, the gods which you have chosen. Let them deliver you at the time of your tribulation. And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned, and do thou unto us whatsoever seemeth good unto thee. Deliver us only, we pray thee, this day. And they put away the strange gods from among them, and served the Lord, and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Now go with me, keep your finger there, but go with me to one more Old Testament uh, reference. It's the book of 1 Samuel, the seventh chapter, 1 Samuel 7. I'm only going to read two verses there, verses 2 and 3. And it came to pass, while the ark abode in Kerjath Jearim, that the long there was a long time there, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And Samuel spoke unto the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts unto the Lord, and serve him only. He will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in this situation that you just had to look and say, Lord, why? Why is this happening? What's going on? I don't know how you spend your prayer time, but let me tell you, when I spend my prayer with the Lord, sometimes I'm bold enough not to question him, but to ask some hard questions. What's really going on with my church? What's really going on with my family? What's really going on with my country? Or Lord, I prayed for this one and, and you didn't heal him or her. Lord, why does it seem that some people are suffering more than others? Yeah, these are the hard questions. Sometimes I get a little personal to say, Lord, if I'm your people, if we are your people, why are we not experiencing the fullness of joy prescribed in your word? Sometimes he answers me and sometimes he's silent. But when I read the scriptures, like, like I read this morning in the text, I start asking God these, these other kinds of questions. And again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not questioning God. His ways are not our ways and his methods are not logical to us. Let me tell you, God will use a storm to bring us peace. He'll use a season of poverty to make us rich. Won't he do it? He'll use a pandemic to, to, pandemic to make the church get out of the four walls so we just don't come to church anymore, but we have to be the church. So I have learned not to question the will of God, but I do confess that in the process, it, it, I bring these concerns to my Heavenly Father. On a corporate level, these texts should spark some concern for all of us. My first question is, Lord, if they were your people, why did you allow them to get in the bondage in the first place? Uh, if they're indeed your chosen people, why didn't you protect them and keep them from, their, from the enemies? What, what do you mean by strange gods? I thought that you were the Lord. How can the people worship strange gods after you've done all for them? I ask these questions. How did you let the ark get into the hands of the enemy? And why did you allow uh, the presence, your presence to be taken from away from your chosen people for 20 years? Furthermore, how do they operate without the presence of the Lord for 20 years? As I began to probe these scriptures, that, that this time the Lord was not silent. He gave me one word that, that was the answer to all my inquiries. 
In this one word, God summed up all the problems, the ills, the dysfunctionality, all the issues with the Christian walk. With one word, God diagnosed the sickness we as Christians suffer most, especially in today's society. And that one word is sin. Sin is the problem. The souls of God's chosen people were sick because of sin. And God allowed them to get into trouble because of sin. Israel's greatest sin? Idolatry. That's worshiping or exalting anything above God. And their rebellion and disobedience was a direct reflection of sin. The desire to serve anything or anyone or any other deity while forgetting all that the Lord has done for us, that's all about sin. It's a lack of trust. It's a real act of rebellion. Church, we have to understand that God is a holy God and he has no desire to reside or abide where sin resides or abides. I know that Paul says in Romans that, that where sin abides, grace does much more abide. But we have to be careful not to abuse God's grace. The word of God also says that my spirit will not strive with man always, for he is flesh. The word strive here means to contend, to fight, to be an opposition of. In other words, God is saying that even though my mercy is from everlasting to everlasting, the day will come when my patience for your flesh will run out. God is a loving and a kind God, but it appears to me that he has a low tolerance for perpetual sin. And so, as it was with the Israelites, God said, I have had enough of your sins, enough of your rebellion, enough of your putting other gods before me, and now I will remove myself from you and leave you. To yourselves. In the case of the story in the book of Judges, God actually thrust his own people into slavery. He allowed them to be enslaved to the very same gods they wanted to worship. We are enslaved to the God of our choice. Can I say that again? We are enslaved to the God of our choice. So here's my first point. It's a question. Which God is now on the throne of your heart? Which God is on the throne of your heart. Catch this. If we are not careful, God will let you be enslaved to the very same gods that you choose to worship. If you keep on worshiping money, God will allow you to become a slave to your money. If you keep on choosing your boyfriend or that girlfriend or whatever over what God says, then he will allow you to become enslaved to that relationship. If you keep worshiping that job and obeying your supervisors or your wallet rather than obey God, you will become a slave to that job. You get, what I'm, you, you get what I'm saying? And see, when you finally hit rock bottom and can't get out of your circumstance, then you want to cry out to God. That's all of us. But, but did you see and hear what God said to them in Judges 10 and 14? He said, don't come crying to me. Cry out to those other gods. Call on your money. Call on your job. Call on that man. Call on that woman and see if they will deliver you. What an awful place to be. I cannot express to you enough this morning how dangerous it would be to be out of the will of God. I, I cannot express to you this morning how dangerously uncomfortable it is to be uncovered in this world today. Uncovered means leaving the protection of the hand of God and being exposed to all the elements of the storms of this life. Israel had finally gotten what they were asking for, and what they were asking for was out of the will of God. Sometimes the things we crave are not what God wants for our lives. In this account, Israel finally surrendered. It had gotten so bad that they had to corporately confess that they had sinned. I don't want you to miss this key here. In verse 15, And the children of Israel said unto the Lord, We have sinned. There had to be a confession of sins. There had to be a public acknowledgment of these sins. Hey, we messed up. And let me tell you something, this takes a great deal of humility, transparency, and maturity. Father, I confess that I've sinned in my life. I have fallen short of what you want from me in my life. I have missed the mark. Psalm 51, David penned these words, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight. But let me also submit this to you. The second point this morning is this. After true confession and repentance, there must be corrective action. Again, after true confession and repentance, there must be 
corrective action. Look at verse 16 of our text. And they put away the strange gods from among them and served the Lord. Remember when they were about to stone the woman that was taken in the very act of adultery? After Jesus dismissed her accusers and forgave her of her transgressions, his words to her was, go and sin no more. So there must be corrective action. Listen, too many times we want to work on the behaviors before we can work on the heart. Changing a behavior seems to be a matter of will, doesn't it? But somehow we keep going back to that same behavior and that same sin, and we continue what I call this cycle of guilt, repentance, temptation, bad behavior, guilt, repentance, temptation, bad behavior. Why is this? Because we cannot change behavior until we first change the heart and change the mentality. So what's going on in your hearts today? Who's, who's sitting on the throne of your hearts? Is God in charge of your life? Has Jesus come into your heart and changed your very nature, changed your mentality? Or are we still up to our old ways? The word of God declares that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. For the former things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. And look what happens when we correct the action. The word declares in verse 16, his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. God felt sorry for his people, and he was moved because the people turned their hearts toward him and did the right thing. Now let's look at the problem Israel faced in our reading from the, from the second uh, reading. That's 1 Samuel 7. Remember the reason why the ark was taken from, uh, from the beginning. Uh, Eli, the high priest, had two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They were sleeping around with the women in the church, stealing the offerings, doing uh, the work of the priesthood, right? But, but living a foul life. And daddy knew what was going on and would not correct his children. Finally, God says enough is enough. So he takes the ark, which represents the glory of God, away from them. And the ark wound up in the hands of the Philistines. Now, here's a hard but obvious question you and I have to ask ourselves from time to time. Lord, am I doing something in my life that is causing me to miss out on operating in your glory? Is there unconfessed sin in my life? And don't worry, saints. I, I believe in the grace of God. God does not play tit for tat. He's not getting us back for something we did or anything crazy like that. That's not how, how this thing works. You cannot work your way to receive or walk into the glory of God. You cannot work your way into salvation. It is a matter of belief. But friends, if there's unconfessed sin in your lives, if there's, there's something going on uh, that, that, that's not right, let me tell you, you can't possibly experience the fullness of joy that God wants for both you and I. And that's both corporately and individually. This is why David said, cast me not away from thy presence, neither take your Holy Spirit from me, right? But David understood that without being in his presence, if the glory has departed, then he could never experience the fullness of joy. That's, that's that individual, but even corporately. Remember the story of Achan and him taking the accursed thing, and it messed up the whole congregation because there was unconfessed sin in the camp. Without being in his presence, without being at the right hand of God, y'all, we can never experience the pleasures of God the way we ought to. Yeah, we're under grace and God has forgiven us, but we must also confess our sin to him. And that's my third point this morning. We must confess our sin to him. We, we got to confess our sin to God so that we can experience the glory of God in our lives to the fullest. The word of God declares that if we confess our sins, that he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. In our text in 1 Samuel, Israel had finally got enough uh, 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 going at, at it, uh, on their own. They got enough. I, I can't do this by myself. And they decided that something finally needed to change. And so after 20 years of not hearing from God, finally, the people lamented. They went hard after God. They tarried before the Lord. They turned down their plates and they prayed and they fasted. Their leaders turned their hearts to the Lord. They refocused the worship and gave sacrifices of praise unto the one true God. The writer of Chronicles says this, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. Saints, the, the very same prescription for the disease of sin still applies today. 
I don't know how you feel about it, but I want to hear from my father concerning me. I'll do anything. I just want to hear his voice. I, I, I need to hear him and feel his presence. We as the body of Christ have to get back to the days where we desire that presence, man, where that presence was so thick in the house that the Lord would literally sit on the house. The presence was so thick that even the preacher couldn't preach. Uh, our programs and agendas were thrown out of the window and the Lord hijacked our services. I don't want to be in a church that can't feel the presence of God, but I want to be in a church where God's presence is there so thick that nobody can leave the same way that they came. People are healed. Souls are saved. People are delivered. I want to be in a church where sinners have the freedom to walk in, but no, once they depart, they will be different. I want to be in a church where perpetual sinners are uncomfortable and the Holy Spirit is free to move. That's not a crazy dream, saints. It's possible. The problem is that God has been taken out of the driver's seat and has been made a passenger in our own modes of spiritual transportation. Brothers and sisters, it's time that we get back to making God the priority. The writer says here, if you do return into the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the strange gods and Ashtaroth from among you and prepare your hearts unto the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. Now, let me go back a little bit. Here are four directives from this test this morning, from this text this morning. I want you to get this. Four directives. Number one, he says, return to the Lord. Get back to God. Desire him. Be Desire and want to be in his presence. Forget about all your wicked ways. Forget about anything you want to do. Let's return to the Lord. Secondly, the second directive is, Put away your strange gods, and not just your strange gods, but your familiar gods, too. Remember, he says, put away your strange gods and Ashtaroth. Ashtaroth, for them, was that god of sexuality, fertility. It was a lustful god. It was a condition of the church. So it wasn't just a strange, it was strange to them in that that wasn't the god that they were supposed to serve, but it was familiar to them and that that's what they had gotten used to. Put that away, too. Directive number three, prepare your hearts unto the Lord. Man. But give yourself over to God, whatever it takes. Lord, I take out anything. If you see any condition in me that's not belonging to you, that's something you don't want me to have, Lord, take it out. I just want to be ready and prepare my heart to receive whatever it is you have for me. And then directive number four says, serve him only. Serve him only. Psalm 66 and 18 says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, then the Lord will not hear me. If you've got sin in your hearts, right? Sin you haven't confessed, anger, grudges, down in the crevices of your spirit, hidden rebellion, secret agendas, ill-conceived motives, a bad attitude, evil speaking, stinking thinking, a filthy spirit. God does not hear our prayers. All dressed up, right? You got a filthy spirit. Long dress, three-piece suit, shout harder than anybody, speak in tongues like it's a second language on the usher board, the choir, head of the chicken frying committee, part of the willing workers union, having a form of godliness. And all that stuff is good. These are good works. But if you don't have a heart, the right spirit, the word of God says the Lord will not hear our prayers. But the Bible teaches us in James 5 and 16 that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Listen. Our lifestyle should not be in contradiction with what is on our lips. You, you and I have to be careful that we aren't just doing lip service, but also life service. Because our lips, with our lips, the same lips that we praise with, but our lives, we profane God. With our lips, we testify, but with our lives, we test the lie. With our lips, we hail each other. But with our lives, we hurl stones of gossip. Yes, my brothers and sisters, many prayer lives are paralyzed, poisoned, powerless, and polluted because something is going on in the heart that does not line up with the word of God. But if you want your prayers to reach and impact the ears of an almighty God, it is imperative that we put away strange gods and worship the one true living God. The writer of this passage lets us know that God will not hear our prayers if sin is sitting on the throne of our lives. Somebody is saying, oh, well, I go to church all the time. I'm a good person. I, I try to do right by people. I am not a sinner. But John 1 and 8 says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The Bible also teaches that 
All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen, there are a whole lot of believers whose prayers are not effective because iniquity is, is something that's hidden somewhere deep in the crevices of their hearts. If sin is your model and master, if sin dictates and dominates your life, if sin is your captain and has held you captive by this crippling condition, that is not conducive to Christian character, I'm going to need for you to surrender to the Lord right now, this morning. Let me tell you something. Sin will replace love with lust, joy with sorrow, comfort with chaos. Sin will turn your gladness into grief, take your generosity and turn it into greed, blessings with burdens, peace with perplexities, hope with despair, will turn your delights into disappointments and will turn purity into perversion. Every time you gossip, every time you have an unchecked evil thought, every time you refuse to forgive others but expect God and others to forgive you, our prayers can run the risk of becoming polluted. Prayer is not some empty emotional ecclesiastical exercise. Prayer is not some routine religious ritual where you rehearse, rehash, and repeat phrases you heard from somebody else. Prayer is a sincere desire from the heart that seeks the ears of God and not the ears of man. Prayer begins from the internal with the purpose of reaching the, uh, the eternal. Prayer is a heartfelt passion. It's pleading in the presence of an almighty God. What's the condition of your heart today? I want to tell you, people of God, this is this th th just because we are on lockdown doesn't mean that Satan is. Can I say that again? Just because the world is on a lockdown doesn't mean that Satan is. The Bible says he is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And, and who, who, who is it that the lion attacks? Easy prey. Pray that has let down their guards and perhaps stop to feed their flesh. Pray that has become too weak or too tired to fight off lions. <laughs> Woe unto them that are at ease in Zion. This lockdown that we're on in this pandemic is no time for rest for the body of Christ. It's prayer time. And we need our hearts to be in the position to both send prayers, increase our expectancy, and receive miracles and blessings. Church, we can do this. We can turn this situation around if you turn your hearts over to God. What's the condition of your heart this morning? Can I pray with you? Gracious Father, we thank you and we love you. We bless your name. Thank you for who you are. And I pray, God, that, that whoever is listening today, Lord God, that this word will take root in their hearts, that their hearts are ready to receive the word, that their hearts are ready for something better and something greater, anything you desire for your people. Lord God, bless the hearts of your people. Help us to have the right motives, the right spirit. Oh God, the right attitude in everything that we do. We want to serve the Lord with gladness. We want to do everything as unto the glory of God. Bless our hearts this morning. Let's love you with all of our hearts. Let's love one another, Lord God, as you've commanded us to do. Lord God, give us a heart for the things that break your heart. Give us a heart for the people that you love, knowing that everybody in this world is loved by you. Help us to love one another. God bless you is my prayer. What is the condition of your heart this morning? Family and friends, we were so blessed to have you with us on today. I wanted to leave this thought with you. There are three major hindrances to prayer, among others, but three I want you to look at. Number one is the sin of pride. Second Chronicles 7 14 says, If my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. The second thing is unconfessed sin. Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? Psalm 66 and 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, then the Lord will not hear me. And then lastly is our lack of generosity, believe it or not. Proverbs 21 and 13 says, Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he shall also cry himself, but shall not be heard. This is the word of God. Friends, if you were touched today, if you were blessed today in some way, we want to hear from you. If you gave your life to Christ or just recommitted yourself, I want you to write us at info at escogop.org. Again, info at escogop.org. Another way you can respond to the word is to sow into it with your gracious giving. 
We need your support financially to keep this ministry going. Two ways. You can text to give at 832-66-COGOP. That's 832-662-6467. And then you can also give online at escogop.org slash give. Again, escogop.org slash give.
we love you. We, we are praying for you. And again, make sure your heart is in the right condition to receive from the Lord. May the Lord bless you real good is my prayer.